So happy Mother's Day. You know, I, I think, as I was thinking about it, I think perhaps Mother's Day may be the hardest sermon for me to write in the year. It, it's hard, and, and, and part of it is because I, I feel like it's a really crucial and important uh, topic and in, in dire need of some insight and encouragement. And, and on the other hand, for some people, it's, it, there's this idea that there's, um, you know, it's fraught with pain and sadness and disappointment and a lot of hurts. And, and, and that's a real big tension to try to handle in, uh, in addressing the topic and the subject because uh, th- there is a lot of, a lot of struggles and uh, disappointments and mixed with the joys, and, and that's a powerful tension. You know, uh, I had a, a third grandbaby born yesterday, and so that was kind of exciting with uh, another, uh, another one coming along. And so there's the joy of the new, uh, new birth, but in my family too, I also know of uh, some miscarriages and, and uh, infertility and some of those other issues that I know bring a lot of pain. And so when you come to Mother's Day, there's all those feelings of joy and, and, and the struggles, too, that uh, I've uh, learned to experience kind of firsthand through, through my own family. And, and, and there's so many, you know, I was just doing a, a list of some of the things. You know, there's, there's other things like motherless, um, estranged from mothers, mother wounds, wannabe mothers, bio, bio moms. There's a whole abortion issue. There's uh, caring for, for moms with Alzheimer's. There's mums with furry babies. I guess the ones can't have mums. And, and all these different kinds of mums out there that, that, and all these issues related to it, it makes it a very emotional, a very power-packed uh, uh, topic to address. And so as we go into it, and then on top of that, I'm in the middle of a series. And sometimes I just punt on Mother's Day and just continue on with my series, you know, and make a little uh, uh, statement to it. But I didn't want to do that this year. And, 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 but yet I, I wanted to somehow, I said, is there a way to tie it into the series too? And uh, so I, you know, thought about it and talked to God a little bit about it and prayed about it. And, and, and I saw this verse and, and the series, by the way, I, I, let me just talk about the series first of all. So we re- review that. So uh, the series is called uh, God's Not Done Yet, right? And in this series, God, uh, we've been talking about uh, based on Philippians chapter 1, 6, and I think uh, packs a lot of hope that God is not done uh, working in our lives. God is, is up to something, and He's working, He's always working in our lives. And, and it's based on that uh, assuring verse in Philippians 1.6 where Paul says, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. And so that, that idea that God is faithfully Carrying to completion that work he's doing in our life is just a really powerful thought that he's not giving up, that he is patient, that he does love us, and, and that he's not done working in our lives. And so, and, and the thing, one of the main things he's doing in our lives is developing character and teaching us character. And we saw last week that sometimes that can be hard because there's pruning um, and, and, and whatnot, but God wants to, to help us to grow and to be fruitful. And so today, I said, how can I tie the series in with Mother's Day, and, and what, what can we do? And uh, I came across this verse, so this is the verse that came to mind. From Proverbs 31, a wife of noble character, who can find? She is worth far more than rubies. And so I just stopped on that verse. I was a little hesitant getting into this chapter because if you know if you're you know if you've read through Proverbs 31, you know what's in that chapter, right? Some of you women have read it, and and you know it's like this picture of this super mom who can do everything, and she's just amazing. And it's like, how do I measure up to that? And you can feel a little discouraged too when you when you read it. But I I stopped on that first verse in in this that final section. Um, in Proverbs, in verse 10, a wife or mom, as we find out later, because she's a mom, of, of noble character, who can find? And so I ask myself the question, where do you find someone? Where do you find a person of character? It, it, it almost sounds like they're rare. Are they? 
And then I thought to myself, oh, I don't want to make it sound like, you know, a good woman of character, they're not out there. Like, that's not a, a good way to think to talk about a Mother's Day. <laughs> and, and so uh, to balance it, I, I talked about, I went back to a few verses earlier in Proverbs 20, in verse 6. It says, many claim to have unfailing love, but a faithful man, who can find? And I thought, okay, so it works both ways. They're basically saying, you know, the author in the Proverbs is saying, okay, people of character, people of good character uh, just aren't everywhere. It's something that has to be developed and something that has to be worked on. And, and so I thought about that question, who can find? Who can find a person of, of character, good character? And so I said, I'm going to go looking. I want, to, I want to look around and see where can I find someone with, with great character. And being, this is, this is a sermon, I'm going to punt, hunt around in the Bible. Who, who are some people of great character? And, and having done a lot of Mother's Day messages over the years, I want to do something different, something creative. And, and so I thought a little bit deeper and a little longer about some people that maybe you hadn't thought about before. In fact, I have a feeling maybe none of these would be people you thought of as people of character. But let's take a look at the first one. I find it in John chapter 6. It says, When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming towards him, Jesus was getting very popular at this point in his ministry, and lots of people were coming. In fact, we find out later there was over 5,000 people in this crowd that was coming towards him. Anyway, this crowd's coming towards him, and he says to Peter, uh, Philip, uh, where can we buy bread for these people to eat? Where, where can we find bread for this? And he asked uh, this only to test. He asked this only to test him. For Jesus, he already uh, had in mind what he was going to do. He already knew his plan. He knew what he was going to do. But he tests Philip. Where are we going to find food for, all the, uh, for these people? And Philip's answer is in the next verse. He's, he says, it would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. I mean, this is way too much money. We don't have that kind of money. There's way too many people, and we're out in the middle of nowhere. How are we ever going to do this? Impossible. Well, another of Jesus' disciples, Andrew, maybe a little bit, uh, you know, wanted to test out, see maybe people brought food. Maybe, maybe we can have a potluck here. Anyway, Andrew, he goes out and looks, and this is Simon Peter's brother, and he spoke up in verse 9, says, uh, here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? I mean, that's all we've got. Now think about it. There's a lot of people there, over 5,000. One person remembers to bring lunch. Now think about that a moment. And as I thought about it, I thought, you know, I'd like to ask that boy, who raised you? Like, who, I mean, and then I thought to myself, uh, who packed your lunch? I mean, did, here's a young boy, and, and there's barley loaves. Did you bake these yourself? Likely not. There was likely a mom behind the scenes who baked the lunch, put the lunch together, packed the lunch, and sent it with her son. For the day. Out of 5,000, there's one. I thought, wow, that, that's, that's pretty interesting. Um, because, you know, that's, that's what mums tend to do, right? They, 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 and, and this young boy, I think, was an example of that. Um, he had a mom or someone behind him, maybe it was a dad, but but probably a mom who, who, uh, who packed the lunch and sent him off on the day to make sure he had what he needed. Because that's what moms do, right? They, they're careful. They want to make sure that their, their kids are fed and they're nurtured and cared for. And in fact, in, in Proverbs 31, there's a verse, in verse 15, it says, she gets up, this is the super mom, right? That she gets up. While it is still night, and she provides food for her family. And okay, maybe this one, girl's over the top, but, but isn't that what moms do? Um, there's a saying in uh, Korean. 
that when you go to a, a, a house in Korea, the mom, will, the first thing she'll say to you usually, in fact, I've been asked this too, I walk in the door, it's not even lunchtime, and she says, have you eaten? That's kind of the greeting. It's like, have you eaten? Well, it's not lunchtime, it's not, you know, but it's just the way they just want to make sure it's part of the nurturing and caring part of the society. And she'll say, you know, have you eaten? Because that's what moms do. They care for others. They, they, they want to make sure that those that they're responsible for or theirs that they care for have what they need for the day. And so I call this first mom, this kind of unknown, unnameless mom, I'm going to call her the giver because she gave of herself. In fact, she five, f- packed five barley loaves, maybe more than this little boy needed. Maybe she was thinking he could share the lunch with somebody else. Um, but she packed this little lunch and sent it off with him. And I thought, it, maybe that's why he was willing to share. It wasn't much, but he was willing to share because he'd been taught well from someone with a generous heart, someone that cared for him and gave. And so she becomes my first example, and I call her the giver. I could have called her the lunch maker or the servant hearted or anything, you know, a number of words, but I settled in on the giver. So the second, the second mom, you probably wouldn't expect this second one to be uh, a woman of character either. Uh, in fact, maybe just the opposite. It was the woman that Jesus met at the well. Remember her? I'm going to just jump into the middle of that story, just give you a few verses and highlight something. But it says in verse 15, John chapter 4, the woman said to him, to Jesus, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to come here to draw water. See, Jesus has been talking about living water. And and it's been very encouraging because uh, she's been listening to him talk about living, and she's coming out in the heat of the day to draw water at the well, and and Jesus says, hey, I want to offer you living water, and she thinks that sounds really good, but Jesus is being a little cryptic here, and he's really talking about spiritual, satisfying her spiritual thirst, and anyways, but he doesn't get into that, and and she just says, "I'll, I'll have some living water, and he tells her in the next verse, verse 16, he says, Go call your husband and come back, which is sort of a weird change of subjects, I would think, when Jesus, why? Anyway, he says, go call your husband and come back. She responds, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you're right when you say, you have no husband. The fact is, you've had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Now, think about those words. Those could come across very judging, right? I mean, she could really feel put off by what Jesus said. She doesn't like to be called out. I mean, who would like to be called out? She was trying to keep that secret. I have no husband. And Jesus said, yeah, you're right. <laughs> but I know the backstory. You've had five. And she could, have, she could have walked away at that point. But I think Jesus must have said it in a way that did not sound judgmental at all because her reaction doesn't sound like she was being defensive or reacting in any way to his statement. In fact, here's what she said. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. You, you have some amazing insight. How did you know that? We haven't met. I can see that you're a prophet. Now, at that point, as the last thing she says, and then the disciples come back from the town. They'd gone in to buy some food, and they'd come back to get Jesus, and there's this interaction with them. And then it says in verse 28, Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, Come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? So she's been pondering and thinking about this. Her first reaction, you must be a prophet. And as she's thinking about it and as the disciples come back and she's thinking about what she's heard, and she comes to a different conclusion. She recognizes that this is not just a prophet. This is the Messiah. So she goes back and tells the people in town and verse 30 says that the people in town, they came out 
and, and made their way towards him, and they all wanted to hear from Jesus. So all these people in town start coming out. So I'm thinking, not only is she, you know, she figured it out, is she smart, she's wise, but, but she's a person of influence. And, and she's used that influence to tell people to come out, and they start flocking out and coming towards Jesus. Now again, people haven't usually stepped up and said, oh, this is a woman of noble character. And you say, well, why? Well, because she's been divorced five times. And yeah, but it doesn't seem like Jesus judged her, did he? Well, then why are you? Well, why would we judge her? In fact, what we have in the text is a woman who's wise and uses her wisdom, wise, wisely, and, and she's a person of influence. We, do, we don't know much else about her. Very little. But as I thought about that wisdom that she had, it, it reflected back on in Proverbs 31, because that was one of the other things in the Supermum passage talked about is, is her wisdom. She speaks with wisdom, and faithful instruction is on her tongue. And, and then in the very beginning of Psalm, uh, Proverbs 31, the very first verse, it's interesting. This last chapter wasn't written by uh, by uh, Solomon. It was written, it says, these are the sayings of, of King Lemuel. Well, we don't know who that is, but King Lemuel. But look at what it says afterwards in note. It says, an inspired utterance his mother taught him. He was taught by his mother in this last chapter. And it's quite an intriguing last chapter. A very famous chapter in the Bible, 31. You might want to read it sometime. I'm just highlighting one verse mostly today. But when you, and it's interesting because there's this prelude section in the first nine verses that gives some wisdom on various topics, and then it concludes with this section on, on this, this uh, woman of character, noble character. And there's, from verses 10 to verse 31, there's 22 verses there. There's 22 letters in the Hebrew language, and each, each, um, each verse begins with a different letter in order of the whole entire Hebrew language. So it's, it's, it's an acrostic, too. We can't see that in English, but it's incredibly designed. And, and you say, this is really well done, whoever put this together um, linguistically and in its content. And you say, oh, it came from a mother, Lemuel's mother, an utterance inspired, taught to him by his mother's influence. And, and, and so when I, when I reflect on Lemuel's mother, I think of this woman at the well and her wisdom and influence, and I think I called the second woman the, the, the wise one, the wise one, our second hero that you probably haven't thought about. Uh, you know, our moms are our first teachers. So I've seen the little ones and being born now and the next generation coming on, you see the moms and their, their little kids and they're teaching and they want their kids to learn. You know, your first teacher, you know, was your mom and your, your dad. They were, they were the first influencers in your life and they had a big impact. I remember a, a conversation that uh, one of my kids said to, uh, uh, one of my boys said to my, my wife, they said, uh, when they were little, said, Mom, I, I want to marry you someday. <laughs> and, and what he was trying to say is, you're, like, you're the best, you're the greatest. You, you do everything for me. And, and I'm so thankful to have you. And somehow we forget that over time, don't we? As we get older, we get independent, and we forget that influence and the wisdom that came from our moms. It's still there, it's still ingrained in us because we learned it from them for in those first five, six years, you know, in a big way, and after that in a smaller way, but we forget over time, right, that they were the best and the wisest and the greatest. And then, and then I, speaking of wisdom, I came across, I was looking for a, a statement, and I, I came across this word of wisdom from uh, Ruth Graham Bell, and this is what... Uh, it says, she, she said, uh, she wrote down, I saw a sign on a strip of highway once that I would like to have copied on my gravestone. It said, end of construction, thank you for your patience. 
And I thought, that ties in perfectly with my series. God's not done yet. Be patient. He's still working on us. And here's a mom, you know, who, who recognized she's not perfect. You know, she doesn't, com- you know, when you try to compare yourself with the Proverbs 31 woman, it's like, oh, I don't, I'm not perfect. But thanks for being patient. Um, construction is ongoing. And one day, Philippians 1.6 says, until the day of Christ, when we meet Christ, it will continue. And then he'll finish it off when we arrive in heaven. But that's a, a powerful, powerful uh, uh, verse that, that we're not, God's not done yet. So the third and the final, final woman that I want to talk to, again, it's kind of an unusual woman. You don't think of her as a person of character. And we find this story in Mark chapter 5. And let me just read it to you. It says, And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. Can you imagine? Uh, it, most believe this was a, a menstrual bleeding, and it was very shameful and very difficult and embarrassing and everything else. So she's dealing with for 12 years. She suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had, yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. They didn't have the medical ability in that period of history to be able to deal with this and figure out what was wrong and help her. And and she spent all her money, everything, trying to get well. So she reached out. She she sought help as best she could. Anyway, when uh, when she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. She'd heard about Jesus. She knew that he was a miracle worker. If I could just get close enough, just touch him, maybe, maybe something will happen. So she, she, says, and she uh, came up behind him, touched his cloak, and because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. And immediately her bleeding stopped, and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering 12 years. And she said, I've been, free, I've been freed from my suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him, and he turned around in the crowd and asked, Who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you ask, Who touched me? Really? But Jesus kept looking around uh, to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, and trembling with fear, She told him the whole truth, and he said to her, Daughter, I love that way he addresses her, right? Daughter, your faith has healed you. Your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. Jesus introduces her as part of the family. He he talks about her faith and its power to overcome. And here she had this shameful condition. She'd spent everything she had. She'd, she'd reached out, and she was resourceful. She tried doctors. She tried everything. Jesus comes to town, and she goes to him. She does whatever she can to overcome this problem, to get rid of the shame. I, I read a story of a mom this week that... Uh, uh, it tells the story. She was getting her uh, pictures done for Christmas, uh, Christmas picture that was sent out as like a Christmas card each year. And uh, she has a couple of young boys, and they were not cooperating at all. On the way, they were getting it professionally done. And on the way to the photographer's uh, place, uh, one of the boys had, f- had fallen down, and it actually cut his, his head. So he's got this scrape and bleeding on his forehead, and they're going to get pictures. And then the other one, they're sitting there getting pictures, and he was so squirmy. They finally just gave him a phone to try to make him sit there because he just wouldn't sit to look at. And anyway, and she's so embarrassed about this, like their behavior, and it's just, you know, she felt like a bad mom, and the picture's going to be horrible now, and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, the photographers do an amazing job. The Photoshop, can, you know, they, sh- they photoshopped out the phone. They couldn't even see the, the phone in, her, in the kid's hand, and they, they cleaned up the, the face, and take away this, the picture, and then she had this beautiful picture, and she sent it off, she was all pleased, and sent it out in the Christmas picture, and, and then she thought later, she said, you know, um, that's not real. The reality is, my kids were horrible that day. 
But, but isn't it true that what we do is we, we try to Photoshop things or we try to make, you know, put our best foot forward and, and we, we want to look good, but we don't feel the same way in the inside. We feel shame because things didn't turn out the way we thought or things didn't go the way we wanted. Um, and now I'm being inauthentic in my card. And, and she said, you know, I wished I had the old... When she went back to the photographer, but he had photoshopped it to such an extent that it couldn't be recovered. But she said, I wished I had that old, that other picture just to remind me of the reality of what life is, is often like. Um, so I see this third woman who come to Jesus, and, and the qualities I see in her are she's resourceful. She had reached out and done everything she can to get rid of the shame finally came to Jesus, and it was her faith, her resourcefulness, and she was filled with faith. Um, and these are the characters that I see in her. Jesus pointed out, Mary, daughter, your faith has healed. He saw that faith in her and the courage to, and strength to reach out and to find a way to get over what she's been through. I was looking for another quote on faith. Jenny Allen, um, an author, female writer, she said this, she says, I saw a sign on a strip of highway once that I would like to have... Nope, oh, sorry, that's the, uh, that's the lot wrong one. By faith, that was the last one. By faith, uh, we could be a generation that wasn't fancy, wasn't perfect, but we lived like our God was real. I'm not perfect either, obviously. <laughs> it wasn't fancy wasn't perfect, but we lived, we let our faith shine through. We lived out our faith. And, and that's what Jesus saw in this woman. A faith that was real, that was resourceful, that was reaching out and doing what she can do to overcome the hardships and the difficulties that life has given her. She was a woman of noble character too. Notably, her faith. So we go back and to the first verse that we started on. A woman of noble character, who can find? You know, as I thought about it, I realized it's not that there is rare to find, but the truth is, it's in the second half. It's when you do find one, she's far more valuable, right? She's worth far more than rubies. So value and treasure that woman. And I think that's the gist of the verse. It's not the fact that it's rarity, but we need to value her. Dis, you know, and despite, despite you know, the women that we've looked at who have who've been, uh, you know, had health challenges or been rejected maritally, um, these were everyday heroes, everyday women that that uh, displayed a character. And you know, we don't even know their names. All three of them are nameless in the Bible. And, and as I thought about that too, I realized, you know, there's a lot of everyday women that need to hear and to be valued. And so we want to say that on Mother's Day, that you are valued. And, 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 and we, we tend to forget sometimes as we've grown older or grown busier or whatever it might be, that um, they, you mums, need to be valued more than rubies. And in God's sight, you certainly are. And so I want to close with that thought. A wife of noble character. Who can find it? Well, we found three in Scripture. I see a whole bunch of people sitting in front of me in this room. They're all over the place. So let's value them. In Jesus' name. But Lord, I just uh, thank you for this time that uh, as we've looked into your word, looked into the scriptures, we see that we see some women that, that uh, kind of the everyday women that just did little things, whether it's making a lunch or, or uh, uh, reaching out for healing or just uh, going out and telling others about you. The everyday heroes... Lord, that 
that showed a great amount of character that reminds us that character is something we can all develop and work on. Character is something you want to see in all of us. And Lord, it's something we need to value. That when we see it, when we see that kind of noble character in one another, that we realize how valuable it is and we treasure it. Lord, thank you for the examples we have here of moms who have given and served and loved and cared for. Lord, we value that. And we value them. We thank you for the bringing them into our lives. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.